but I'm very excited about this season of your lives. I said something to the 8 o'clock congregation, and, and I'll repeat it with you all, because nothing makes me more fulfilled as a pastor. And you all know me, I'm a, uh, well, they call me bishop, I was ordained a bishop, and then they called me the apostle, and I don't have no problem with, none, with any of that. I, I am who God says I am. But, but, but know this, more than putting a label on my name, I'd rather do the work. Yeah. So, so I just said that, and I don't even know why I said that, but in any case, um, I just want you all to know that nothing brings me more satisfaction as a leader trying to lead a people of God in the direction of following Jesus Christ, so much so that we become disciples of Jesus Christ. And not just ordinary, simple disciples, but mature disciples of Jesus Christ. I want y'all to have more than just a hand clap. I want you to have more than just a dance. I want you to have more than just a shout. I want you to have more than just an emotional experience. I want you to have the love of God proceeding from your heart to humanity. I want you to have the wisdom of God. I want you to get the word of God in you where you can, you can stand with anybody and know for an assurity that the word of God is still a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And then... When we gather together on Sunday mornings like this, when we come together on Thursday nights, nothing brings me greater reward than to see you worship God, than to see you in your consistency to come and bless the name of our God. This church is not about me. I'm not, I'm not saying that, Lord, for you to take me away, but um, this church is not just about me. This, is, this church is about the kingdom of God. And, and let me say this to you. Having you all come every single week and fill this church, and the only reason why we're not running over right now is because our youth is down the street. But because you come consistently every week, can, please, if you never hear me say it again, and you probably will, but I want to say thank you. Thank you for making this church a church. Thank you for coming and, and getting refueled for your life's journey. Thank you for not counting it robbery to, to gather. The Bible says, forget not the assemblies of ourselves together where there's unity, there's strength. And the only way that we can learn how to do the kingdom of God is with other kingdom members. Nothing against social media, nothing against streaming congregation. Thank you all for tuning in today. Yet at the same time, don't let the streaming be your ultimate church participation. So I would encourage you. Thank you all. You make my heart so glad. I, I want to do this every single week. I don't think there's a week where I don't want to do it. Well, no, there's no week that I don't want to do it. I love doing what I'm doing because you love being here to participate in it. Hold on one second. Hey, honey. Would you join me on this one? You, you don't have to get up. You can sit right there. But, but can we just, don't you do this. We just want to say thank you and applaud you. No, not you. This is, this is me and Pastor. Come on, baby. I'm going to need you to be a little louder. Okay, that's good, right? Okay, that's enough. I'm tired. Thank you, church. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. I love you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I want to thank, thank you to all of those who participate in sanctuary ministry. Thank you to my pastors and ministers and Elders, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Stacy, for preaching for me last week. Thank you. <laughs> the Lord has opened up doors for me to go and to, uh, sometimes he leads me to establish some ministries and other times he leads me to support ministries. And, and because we got great pastors, we got great ministers of the gospel, We've got great uh, worship teams. We've got great musicians. We've got great prayer teams. We've got the greatest intercessors in the world. And because we have that, I can do what God's called me to do and still be connected to you all. 
Thank you for this privilege. Genesis chapter number one. If I may draw your attention just for the, I done wasted a couple of minutes and I don't think I can get it back. And y'all not gonna get, nobody said, no, Bishop, you got it. Go ahead. All right, thank you very much. All right, I'll, 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 I'll stick to the numbers. Genesis chapter number one, a very familiar scripture, passage of scripture. You read it over and over again. Uh, but it's like Taraji said, Taraji said, if, 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 if you hear in the word of God, no longer excites you, you probably have been missing church way too much. I'm going to try that one more time because that was prophetic. Taraji said, if, if, if you hear in the word of God and it doesn't do something to you, it doesn't awaken something in you, then there has to be, I'm telling you, something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with the word because the word is still quick and powerful, sharpening in any two-way sword. Pierces beyond asunder, the sun, the soul, and the spirit. It, it pulls out those things that are of the spirit realm. It enlightens the heart and the mind to the, uh, to the provisions that God has provided for you to not just get a miracle, but to live your whole life out. It is a word that is a lamp to your feet, and I said it earlier, and a light unto your path. At the entrance of the word of the Lord, it bringeth forth light and life. When you hear the word of God, revelation, impartation begins to proceed from the word into your lives. And thereby your, I'm preaching already. And thereby your faith grows. Everybody say, my faith got to grow. Please, do, do, not, do not live each week, go in and out of these weeks and not feel your faith growing. Well, if you don't feel it growing, it's probably because you're not getting into the word. It is going to be the word. And, and we're going we're gonna to begin to usher in the word of the Lord more in this church than has ever been ushered in before. I really got something in my mind, in my heart right now. I'm gonna, we're going to create a, 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 a flow, a, a river flowing. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I just saw it in the spirit. We're going to put something in the spirit. Someone mentioned to me about a, a way that we could do this. And we're going to constantly have the flow of water, which is the flow of the word of God. Because heaven and earth shall pass away, but not one word of God is going to fall to the ground and not bring forth any kind of fruit. The word of God cannot return void. If God said it, he'll do it. And if you speak it, he'll bring it to pass. I said if God said it, he'll do it. And if you speak it, he'll bring it to pass. I believe with all my heart, saints of God, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Your whole life is geared on what you say. Your words have the, have the power to create what is not. That was a good place for you to say, Jesus. Your word has the power, and I know we don't use this word, we don't like to use this word, but your word has the power to manipulate the very essence of life outside of our human comprehension and understanding. In other words, your words has the power to affect nature. I'm way off. I know I'm off track right now, but I'm about to read Genesis to you, and if you don't understand what I'm saying, you're going to miss the whole impact of this scripture that's being applied to your life. Okay. Genesis chapter number one, beginning at verse number one, and I just want to read a few verses of the scripture. In the beginning, God, you know the scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What, did, what happened in the beginning? Who did it? The Bible says, and the earth was, and this is the part that I want you to really get. The earth was without form, and what? How was the earth? The Bible says, and not only was form, no form, void, but the Bible says, I'm reading it, you're reading it with me, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. I need God to give you a revelation on the face of the deep because I'll be here all afternoon trying to describe that face of the deep to you. But it is the place that goes beyond what you see. It is that place that causes you to dig deeper. Somebody say, I got to dig deeper now. <laughs> now, please understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying you got to dig deeper so that you can become mystical and become that kind of person that don't nobody want to be around. But I'm talking about that, that face of the deep, the face of the deep. When we look into the face of God, we're looking into the face of the deep. We're not looking at our ordinary face is what I want you to get. That's just, I, just, I just want you to get that. You are looking at something that if you're not in tune to get, you won't receive looking into the face and the deepness of our God. 
which is, in, and see, what's, what's important? I ain't got time. But what's important as you look into the deep, you got to understand what's happening in the deep. Because it's not enough for you to come to church and not know what's happening in the church. Thereby, it's not important. It's not enough for you. It's not enough. It's not enough. It is important. It's not enough for you to get in the face of God and not know what you get. Deep calls under deep. Okay, let, let me go on. He says, and the Spirit of God, this is really important, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Waters is always a symbol of life. So we're, glory to Jesus. So wherever there is a move of God, there is what? You got it. Wherever there's a move of God, there is. You can't have a move of God and not have life. Can I say this? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, this is not in my notes, but I, I just thought about this. There comes a scene. Glory to Jesus. I'm sorry. Revelations is coming right now, y'all. Y'all, hold on. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's only coming because y'all praying. But there comes, listen, listen to this. There comes a moment in our life, this is where I, I got it. This is where I got it. There comes a moment in all of our lives as believers where we really comprehend, understand that there are certain things that cannot coexist. Life cannot coexist with death. Right cannot coexist with wrong. Up cannot coexist with down. You either got one or the other. What am I saying? I'm getting that. So there's certain things that you got to stop allowing to coexist in you. The Bible says, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are, bam, out of here. Can I get 45 people to shout, I ain't like that anymore. Because it cannot coexist in me. I can't be a new creation and be an old creation at the same time. It just, it don't work like that. Which, which brings me to a real complete understanding about how God does what God does. He said, he said, the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. And then all of a sudden, God moved upon the face of the waters. And here's, here's the transition. The transition was, and God said. Well, if I was a real good preacher, I would lean on that a whole lot longer. The transition is, the thing that pivots, the thing that turns it, the thing that shifts it, is God says something to it. Can you do me a favor? Look at your neighbor, grab the hand of your neighbor and say, neighbor, all you need, all you need is what God says. What God says. All you need is what he says. I don't, I don't need more money without knowing what God says about my money. I don't need more love if I don't know what he says about the love that I'm going to get from him. I'm sorry, you, know, you don't like it. I don't know why that came up in my head about this coexistence. We, we, we're, trying to be, we're trying to be good and bad at the same time. We're trying to be right and wrong at the same time. There ain't no fruit in that. That ain't nothing but a bunch of confusion. Because at some point, at some level, one or the other is going to be dominant. You hang around with it long enough, sooner or later, one will outdo the other. Come at Esau and Jacob. No, we don't want to do that. One is going to win sooner or later. So what I'm saying is we got to begin to have a consciousness of not allowing two things to coexist co within us that should not be. You're not like what you were. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. 
Old things have passed away. Behold, okay, to transition in this beginning of creation, watch, look at this, is that God begins to speak. And the only thing he says is, let there be light. He just says, let the light come on. This morning, I got a few more minutes left. I just want to turn on the lights for you. I want to turn on the lights. I want to remind you of some things that is already in the word of God. So my subject this morning is, and look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, something better, something better is, coming. is coming. Say it again. Something better, something better is coming. I'm almost there. Tell your neighbor one more time behind you. Tell him, I heard today, I heard today for, you, for you something better is coming. If you're in void, emptiness, formless, if you're in darkness, I came to tell the enemy something better is coming. If you're confused, stressed out, agonizing over stuff you can't change, I come to tell you something better is coming. Okay, let me give you a few more scriptures and I'll get out of here. Okay, this is in reference to what, what I'm teaching and preaching this morning. Uh, this is a good added scripture. Psalms 1811. And th th this, I got this from one of my spiritual sons. He, he showed me this scripture and I just kind of put it in there. I thought it was absolutely amazing. And I've been reading the Bible for a long time, but I don't know, I can't remember this scripture. Because <laughs> we both, most of the time we read Psalms 1, we read Psalms 23, Psalms 100, and that's about it. <laughs> but this particular scripture, let, let, well, you know what, let me, let me set the table for you because you can, so you can fully understand it. When I read Genesis chapter number one, I talked about in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So what I want you to get in your hearts and in your mind is the fact that your God created everything. Yes. Come on, say it out loud. Say God. God. No, 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 no. Say my God. my God. Make it personal. Say my good God, my good God. created everything. I want to, let me just let that sink in for a second because I need you to leave here with a clear consciousness and understanding that takes you into the deep recesses of the will and the plan and the purpose of God that's being unfolded in your life. Things will happen that you may not like for it to happen. You may not want for it to happen, but it's happening because God created it so that it would happen. And then when you know and watch and see it happening, even though you think it's not for your good, and we know that all things are working together for my good. So everything that I go through, every everything that I am engaged in, I got to remember that God created it. I know you don't like that right there because some of y'all are thinking about some bad stuff that you're in right now, but I need you to know it's going to be all right. Something better is coming because first and foremost, you know that God created it. Now, if you know God created it, you also have to know that what he created cannot be bigger and better than the creator. So what's bigger than what God created it's the God that created it. I don't know. That didn't make no sense. That would sound like I was repeating myself. But listen carefully. Catch it by the spirit. You got to catch this. So what was created can never, ever, can never, ever be greater. Than... This leads me into a, a thought that I was having um, a little while ago. It's a thought that I was having about the purpose by which God has designed us to be and do what he's called us to do. You see, when God began to create things, he created everything based on a particular design. He didn't create things without a pattern in mind. I'm sorry. Which means whatever has been created can never ever surprise the creator. God can never be surprised about your dilemma. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to stop right there just for a second and say that's why you can dance and shout like you do on credit. You can dance and shout before the transition happens because you know who's really in control. And he will never put more on you than you can handle. What you got to determine and understand in your own self is that the harder the burden, the trial, the struggle is, is because he's just making you stronger, bigger, badder than you have thought yourself could be. That's all that's about. He'll never break you through something without proving to you that you're able to bear it. 
you forgot that you were bad like that. I wish I can get some people in the house. You know how we do with our hands. What? Come on, y'all, practice say I'm bad like that. And I don't mean bad in the negative sense. I mean you just, you strong like that. You're powerful like that. And let me prove it to you. Because after he creates everything, he creates the void. He creates the void. Because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was void. That means he created the void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. He created the darkness. It was without form. This blows my mind about God. What God can do, because we think in our minds that what God does is he creates things. He creates pieces. But when I read the text, Mom, I discovered that he creates nothing. See, that's too much. Because how can nothing be created? Because nothing is nothing. But he said it was formless. It didn't have anything. Right. Sally, you can hit me up and give me some more insight on this. But he's, because he's the God of the beginning of all of creation, he has the capacity within himself not to leave out anything. So when you go through empty moments, he's still right there. When you say, I feel all alone, God knows about being alone. He creates aloneness. No, seriously. Seriously, y'all. This is killing me right now, y'all. Well, this is wearing me out, y'all. Fawn, this is wearing me out. I got to catch my breath right now. Give me some water. No. What am I trying to get you to see? I'm trying to get you to see the God of your creation. I want, to, I want you to further see that regardless of what shape, form, what is and what is not, it is not bigger than your God. It is never greater than your God. It is never more powerful. Well, can the camera see me? I'm, oh, Lord, I'm way out here. They probably texting me, get back in the light. Back in the light, y'all. So the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. But then God says something to bring a transition. This is the part that blows my mind, too. He brings about a transition from the darkness. This is going to help somebody who feels that you're living in darkness. And while everybody in the world even says that darkness is a bad thing, uh, you don't want to be found in that place of darkness in your life where nothing is happening, nothing is being fruitful, nothing is growing, nothing is, is blossoming. It's just, have you ever been there? Anybody? Been there? I heard people say, Bishop, what? What did baby say? No, people have said, people said, Bishop, I know you preach every Sunday and everything, but I need you to know I'm in a dark place right now. And can I tell y'all what I used to say to them when they would tell me I'm in a dark place because I didn't get this revelation? When you don't have a revelation, you can get stuck. When you don't have a revelation, you can get stuck in an unstuckable place because you're not supposed to get stuck. Okay, let me finish. So what I would say to them was, oh, let me pray for you, glory to God. Oh, God, deliver. I didn't have no revelation. I didn't have the revelation that God does his best work in the dark. Your picture won't even be developed if it's always in the light. You got to get in the dark room 
so he can so the so the chemicals and the water can make your picture real I dare you to give somebody a high five and say I want a real picture I want a real picture I don't want an overexposed picture I don't want an underexposed picture I want the perfect picture. So, so I gotta go, Trina. I gotta go through the darkness. The, the Bible, so the Bible says, Whoa, Lord, you had to take me through all that to just read one scripture. So the Bible says in Psalms 18, verse 11, he says, He made darkness his secret place. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That does not make sense. Why would God make the darkness his secret place? If I was young, I would have jumped. Why would God make the darkness his secret place? I asked that question. I was, I was trying to, trying to work that thing out. When you sent me that verse, good. I was saying, Lord, why would you make the darkness your secret place? And then, bingo, the light came on. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High God will abide under the. The dark place is the. Of the Almighty God. <laughs> Glory to God forever. Revelation. He said, We'll abide under the shadow. Last I checked, the shadow is dark. Can I help somebody? Don't demonize the dark place. Get in the dark place. You know, that's theologically incorrect because he says, I'm the light of the world. He calls you to be the light of the world. But here's how it works. You can't get light except you had some darkness. So what God says to... I, and I think what God, when he says this, I think... The scripture is because he knows that we as human beings will find ourselves in the dark place and misinterpret the place. Do you not know that your perception about things, even the things of God, is real important? I dare to give somebody a high five and say, you got to have the right perception, baby girl. Maybe I can find three people that may get this. Based on what you're going through, Stuff that you didn't ask God for, but he wanted to qualify you for something greater. You got to have the right perception, baby girl. Brother, you got to have the right mindset. You got to have it so fixed in you that you say like, like the Bible said, yea, though I walk through the valley, not run from the valley. Get yourself together, go through the valley of the shadow of death and I will not fear anything. I wish I wish I wish they could show up Shad Man a bad Negro um, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego they got in the fire they couldn't see the other guy unless they got in the fire. Right, right, right. There's some things that you're not going to see, God, until you get in the dark place. There's certain revelations that you're not going to capture unless you get in the hidden place. Oh, where he does his best work. I, I need to stop right here because I'm about to lose my mind. Do me a favor. Do me a favor. Would you please strengthen your sister or brother? Grab them by the hand and tell them wherever you are, it's really okay. Uh, because God created it. Wherever, wherever 
you are, God created it. Whatever it looks like, God created it. Whatever it smells like, God created it. Whatever you think it's going to do to you, God created it. And whatever has been created cannot be bigger than the creator. Somebody shout, God did it all. He did it all. He is Alpha and Omega. He started it and he will finish. As a matter of fact, he's the God that sets the ending before the beginning. Grab your neighbor and say, neighbor, he already knows you're coming out of that. He created it for you to come out of it. He created the Smith and the Western. He created the arrow by day so that you can figure it out in yourself that whatever state I find myself in, whatever condition I find myself in, that's what Paul said, I've learned to be content. I was beat up, I was dragged. I was messed up and plucked up. Didn't, like, didn't seem like I had anybody to help me. Oh, but the Lord was right there. Would you please encourage your neighbor? Give him a high five, a low five. Punch him, kick him. Tell him God is right there in the midst. He's in the midst of your trials. He's in the midst of your struggle. He's in the midst of your anger. He's in the midst of your complaining. He's in the midst of your sorrow. He's in the midst of your down. He's in the midst of your confusion. He's right there in the Somebody shout, he made it. I can take it. He made it. I can take it. My time is up. Don't forget, he made darkness his history place. Something better is coming. Something better is coming. Something better is coming. Because the Bible says, out of the midst of void, formless, nothingness, emptiness, he hovered. Cell, cell, when it was dark, when it was empty, when it was a mess, he was. I mean, when you didn't feel him, see him, taste him, smell him, he was still hovering over you. You didn't like what was happening, but he was still, he was brooding over you. He was brooding over you like a hen broders over the chicklet. He was waiting for you to break out of that shell and see him for who he is. I'm your shield and your buckler. I'm your provider. I'm your help in the midst of your trouble. You got to see me for who I am. I need you to go over somebody and tell them he's still over you. You're mad about something, but he's over you. You're upset about something, but he's still over you. You don't like stuff, but he's still over you. His battle over me is love. People treated you bad. But God says, I'm still got you covered. Somebody lost your job. But God said, I still got you covered. And if you can hold on just a little while longer, the best is yet to come. Better is on the way. Somebody grab your neighbor and say, neighbor, God wants me to tell you that something better is on the way get ready 
Conclusion of the whole matter. After this, I don't care what y'all do. You can go home, you can sit down, you can dance, you can go get some chicken and whatever you want to do. Hear what the Lord says to you. The Bible says we are not ignorant of the enemy's devices. He says, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. But in all of your getting, get understanding. The Lord does not want you to misinterpret some things that might happen tomorrow or the next day. Because in order for better to come, something has to be removed. 
Hebrews chapter 12 says it's the removal of those things that can be shaken that that which remains can be established in order for God to establish some things something has to go whatever that thing is so do not misinterpret a storm do not misinterpret a trial do not misinterpret something that seems to be squeezing you for all God is doing is causing you to give birth through something that he has established so don't let the enemy win in that area of your mind for God is telling you now that something has to go in order for better to come. You got to make room for what that is that God wants to establish in your life, saith the Lord. Somebody shout yes. Yes, Lord.